Labor costs are one of the heaviest burdens in doing business, and there's no dearth of reporting about how you get more out of fewer people. Well, a new INSEAD research paper takes a different look at the impact of workload on worker productivity. The paper is called, When Does the Devil Make Work? Catchy phrase there. And joining me now is the co-author of that paper. He is INSEAD Professor of Technology and Operations Management, Sergei Natasin. Thanks for being with us. Uh, glad to be here, Shelley. A lot of people think of assembly lines or work, work factory lines, something like that, when, when you think of productivity. You looked at restaurants, and more specifically restaurant waiters. Why did you choose this? Uh, well, um, I think main reason is because assembly lines nowadays are not that interesting. Um, if you take a, uh, some reasonably advanced assembly line, like an automotive manufacturer, the car comes out every 60 seconds or so. And typically the workers are trained and the work is organized in such a way that there is really not much that can go differently. So you're not going to find a lot of huge differences in productivity between different workers. Um, moreover, it's not really easy to uh, maybe track what individual workers are doing on the assembly line. On the other hand, in a restaurant, things are completely different. Um, employees differ drastically in productivity. And this is something that really shocked us when we first looked at this data. We actually saw that uh, some workers just on average, day after day, week after week, sell more than others. Academics mostly looked at factory-like environments, and so this is greatly understudied area, uh, despite the fact that about 10% of U.S. Uh, workforce works actually in restaurants. So it's a huge employer as well. Let, let me just pull up a few things here. Who, who was your co-author in this? Uh, so it's uh, it's my former student, uh, Tom Tan. He's a now uh, assistant professor at uh, uh, Southern Methodist University Cox School of Business. Okay, and the restaurant chain, I, I know you can't, for confidentiality reasons, name it, but what level was it? Are we talking about, um, I mean, a family-type restaurant, or it's not fast food? No, it's, it's a family-type restaurant, and, and it's a relatively small chain, maybe 20 restaurants. Um, and so I would say customer service there is fairly important um, because, you know, the waiter actually talks to people when taking order and suggests things, and, and people don't go there for 15-minute meals. They actually spend significant amount of time there, where, uh, which is why uh, waiter-customer interaction becomes extremely important. Right. Let me ask a question about, I mean, time is money, okay? So in a restaurant, you have a strange relationship there, and you, you talk about this in the paper. Um, ordering more food will presumably increase the amount of the bill and possibly the tip, but it means that they're sitting at the table longer, and the waiter has to work more because he's bringing more food uh, Presumably, um, and so, but if they're at the table longer, the tables turn over less rapidly, and that means less money. How do you balance that out? Uh, it's basically a question that every um, every waiter has to struggle with, um, and and I think um, wait, of course, how much time customer spends at the table is largely controlled by the customer, but waiter can influence that. The good waiter assesses. Um, assesses kind of customers and says, look, um, do I think those guys will order more or am I better off uh, wrapping up the service pretty quickly and paying attention more to other customers or maybe hoping that the table will free up and new customers will come in. And of course, this will depend also on whether there are customers waiting or not. So, so I think, I do think the good waiters, the big difference between good and wait, ba waiter and bad waiter is that the good waiter can evaluate this kind of trade-off and based on his experience, he can decide whether he should continue serving customers or try to basically politely get rid of them. Okay, so how did you actually, what did you actually find? What's the takeaway here? Um, so what we found, I think, surprised, surprised us a lot. So um, in, in, in one sentence, uh, what we found is that you can actually reduce number of waiters working in the restaurant, and that will both reduce costs and increase sales. So that, sound, that so sounds just outright crazy. Um, a little bit. Yeah, and, and <laughs> explanation there is, is, um, uh, is not very intuitive, but what we found is that productivity 
um, of workers um, in a restaurant actually depends on how much demand is there. If I have no demand, if, if I serve just one table, you know, I'm very slow. Uh, why is that? Well, I, I think because when I don't have much to do, I naturally start filling up my time with extraneous things. I start talking to co-workers, you know, chatting with cook, uh, watching TV, you know, I don't check on my, um, on my um, customers all that often. But then if I keep uh, adding customers, I start speeding up. I see that now I don't really have time to procrastinate. So I kind of start running around all the time and I, and I approach them more often, I bring them drinks more often, they order more as a result. And so my productivity actually goes up as my workload goes up. Of course, at some point, if there are too many tables allocated to me, I get completely busy. And I forget to suggest an appetizer. I forget to suggest, um, you know, more expensive wine. I just simply don't have time for this. And so then after a certain point, uh, there is a, a tipping point and my productivity starts going down. So, so the trick there, if you want to manage your labor correctly, you want to catch this um, workload at the right kind of a tipping point at the maximum. And so once you increase their utilization a little bit, that is allocate more customers per waiter, actually they start selling more and you can reduce your costs uh, by having fewer waiters on the floor, which uh, counterintuitively results in higher sales. So it's a little bit referring to the title of your paper, when does the devil make work? The exactly. Make, the make exactly. work being you're going to fill your time regardless. Yes, exactly. So this is, I think this is what happens uh, in a restaurant and, you know, we don't have um, direct evidence of that. So, you know, ideally what you would like to do is maybe install a camera in a restaurant and see what waiters are actually doing when they are underutilized. Um, so that's kind of a continuation of my project. Maybe, you know, at some point we'll get there. Uh, but we strongly suspect that uh, the devil kind of fills free time with extraneous activities which have nothing to do with, uh, with work. I'm just wondering, is there a way of installing software for scheduling? I think you mentioned in your paper too that the restaurant chain was installing some kind of software that I guess people weren't aware that it was there, but did it take this sort of thing into account? The way we obtained this data is uh, through uh, installation of um, workforce scheduling software. And workforce scheduling software, I must say, it, it's not a new thing. It's, it's existed for a while. Uh, typically, workforce scheduling software is, is very simple. It, it basically takes preferences of employees into account and allocates them to certain shifts. Um, assuming that their productivity is, is basically linear, the, you know, the more people you put in, you know, the, the more customers you can serve. And most restaurants nowadays use some kind of a rule of thumb. They basically say, look, here is how many customers per uh, waiter I need to have. So normal kind of software which exists out there doesn't really take this tipping point effect into account. So. Uh, so uh, naturally, we uh, we are working on um, incorporating this in the software, uh, but we are we are going beyond that. So uh, to go beyond that, what we are trying to do is to recognize the fact that um, servers or waiters have drastically different performance, dr drastically different capabilities, and so um, when you allocate um, waiters to time slots, you have to take this into account. So you don't just say it's going to be two people working at lunch on Monday. You say if it's Josh and Anne, then I need only two. But if this is some other three, some other people, then maybe I need three. You know. So we go beyond that and kind of try to uh, more accurately account for capabilities of waiters. Did you find any difference between Josh and Anne, like between men and women in their abilities here? Um, well, um, not, not, not really. So we didn't look at that in this particular study. Um, I strongly suspect that um, uh, you shouldn't just look at Josh and Anne, you should also look at who they're serving. Because if Anne is serving a bunch of Joshes, then maybe <laughs> she'll do better, you know. Um, but, but as you know, on, on, a, on a check, you don't see who the customers are, right? So again, uh, ideally, the way you would address this problem is through video recording, um, which is a separate project I'm working on right now. Clearly, what are you going to do with what you've learned here? 
Um, so uh, the main takeaway of the paper is if you take into consideration this tipping point and if you find it correctly and if you um, if you um, allocate work to uh, waiters correctly, uh, turns out you can actually drastically increase profitability of the restaurant. So our estimates suggest that you can increase revenues by something like 30 percent um, without increase in costs. And, and, you know, if you think about restaurant industry, it's a very commoditized, low margin industry. We are talking about 3, 4 percent net profit on average. At the same time, if you look at productivity studies, it is known that um, restaurant worker productivity is only half of assembly line worker productivity. So we know there is a potential, we just don't know how to get, get it out of people. And what our paper finds is there is a very uh, simple way. You actually recognize that uh, people are not machines, that they change their behavior under load. And once you recognize that, uh, you can actually do much better and you can allocate work better and get more out of the same workforce. Presumably you can extrapolate this to other service-oriented, labor-intensive, personal touch industries. I mean, is there one yes, that comes yes. to mind? Yes, I would, yeah, I, I definitely think so. And there have been, um, coincidentally, I think, um, several studies which look, for example, at healthcare. And they show similar effects in healthcare and how uh, doctors uh, operate, how many errors, for example, they make, depending on the load, how nurses operate. And, and again, in all of those settings, uh, it has been shown that there is a tipping point. Uh, people generally positively respond to increasing workload. They speed up, they start being more accurate, they work better. But then there is a tipping point after which everything deteriorates. So you have to be aware of that. And, you know, the reason is humans are not machines. Well, that's good to hear that scientific research actually <laughs> supports that theory. Right, absolutely, yeah. So the next thing seems to be we need to figure out if women are different from men. Okay, well, we'll look forward to uh, hearing or reading your next paper then. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you, Shelley. For being with us on NCN Knowledge. Thank you.